All right, would you turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. In this chapter, we have a picture of sorrow in humanity. And would you keep your finger there for just a moment and turn over to Isaiah 49. Keep your finger in Mark 5. Turn over to the book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, the chapter is 49, if you would please. Isaiah, the 49th chapter. And as a verse over there that thrills my soul this morning, Isaiah 49, because it's about the Lord Jesus. And this is what it says, verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 49. Behold, I have graving thee upon the palms of my hands. And that's the part I want you to read with me. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, both hands. Then go back to verse 10 of Isaiah 49. They shall not hunger, speaking of Israel, of course, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he had mercy on them. For he that had mercy on them shall lead them, even by what? The springs of water. Now notice that springs of water. Shall he guide them? And I like verse 11. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Now down in verse 13. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. Then down in verse... 15. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she could not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Notice that I'm going to be referring to that in just a moment. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. And behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Then back to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, we have a scene which I think is one of the most pathetic scenes that could ever picture the earth. It's a human picture of suffering. It's a human picture of sorrow, and it is a human picture of sadness. It's a picture that Jesus Christ looked upon with eyes of compassion and with a heart filled with understanding and love. The first scene that Jesus Christ sees as he comes over in verse 1 on the other side of the country of the Gadarenes. He comes out of the ship. And verse 2 says, Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now notice that he thought Jesus was tormenting him, and it wasn't Jesus at all. How many times people think Jesus is doing the tormenting when it's just a demon spirit? And they think, well, it's God's fault. Why is God allowing it when it isn't God at all? And for he said unto him, that's Jesus speaking to the man in verse 8, Come out of the man, for thou hast unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And we besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, Legion, all the devils, some sixty of them. And they said, As they were in the man, Send us unto the swine, that we may enter into them. We've got to have some human animal or some human that we may inhabit. Would you please, they didn't say please, but they said send us 
to something that we can inhabit. We don't like just dwelling in the atmosphere or the air. We must have someone, somebody that we can indwell. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. He let them leave. He had that quality of life and that kind of authority. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Just like hundreds and thousands today, this very hour, are choked in the sea. In Revelation 17:15. The sea is a multitude of people upon earth. That is what it's a type of, though here it is a literal truth in a literal sea. But it's a type of a multitude of people. And demons are driving people, multitudes of people, to be choked so that the life of God cannot have free course. And so that body cannot be inhabited by Jesus Christ, but rather it's inhabited by a terrible fearful, negative spirit which torments and drives and nags the soul into despair and into a deplorable end with a devastating destruction. In verse 14, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. They went out to see what it was that was done, and they came, uh, they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had, and had the legions, in other words, had the sixty demons. This is how they discovered the man, sitting, and that speaks of resting, clothed, and that speaks of the righteousness of God in Isaiah 61.10, and in his right mind, and that speaks of a renewed mind through the Holy Spirit. And they were afraid when they saw a man totally delivered that was tormented that lived in the tombs, that did not have clothes, that could not be with his family, that wasn't able to associate with society. And when they saw this man that was crazy, that was a lunatic, he was so strong that chains could not bind him, they were afraid to see what God had done. Though it was a miracle, they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. Notice this. He was possessed with a devil, and yet he had sixty demons. It's considered singular, and yet in the singular possession of Satan himself, there were sixty demonic personalities with will, emotion, and mind indwelling this individual. The raging temper. A demon, perhaps, if it could be today. A demon of alcohol. A demon of lust. A demon of lying. A demon of anger. A demon of jealousy. A demon of resentment. A demon of bitterness. A demon of... Crookedness, a demon of lying, a demon of gossip, all of these things are always caused by demons. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers behind them. In Ephesians 6.10. The demon of fear. God has not given us fear in 2 Timothy 1.7. Fear is always either the indirect obsession or the overall general influence of demonic forces. And the only one that can ever cast them out is Jesus Christ in his life and his word himself and the authority that he has given his body. They were afraid. The first man in human sorrow that Jesus saw was a twisted up mind. Because the word of God says in verse 15, he was clothed and in his right mind. The first thing that goes bad with man is his mind. The first thing that needs to be straightened out is his mind. The first thing that gets angry, indifferent, passive, lustful, deceitful, perverted is the mind of man. The first thing that Satan attacks to make people do strange things, he attacks the mind. His spirits aren't interested in your body first. God deals from within. God is interested with your mind, not your body first. 
Then he's interested with your body, also with your mind. Demons don't start from out and work within. They start within and work without. The first terrible thing in human, in this human picture, that Jesus Christ sees is a man that has a sick mind. This is the worst kind of problem. This is human depravity at its worst. This is a picture of sorrow to the utmost. And Jesus Christ knows today that the reason why we have so many things, so many terrible things are going on, is because of sick minds. And you can do 101 things, but if you don't have a renewed mind, you go right on being sick. Whatever your terrible weakness is mentally, it could be a terrible temper. It could be a devastating attitude toward others. It could be a, an idea that you've got to smoke to survive. It could be an idea that you've got to hang on to your house to live. It could be an idea that you've got to be lustful in order to be happy. Whatever it is, that's all because you have a sick mind. And behind that mind is a spirit. A spirit that you cannot see. A spirit that if he has not possessed you, he is influencing you directly. And so we have Jesus Christ coming to a man with a sick mind. And the first thing that man needs today is a renewed mind. God needs to straighten out the mind of man so that man can have the mind of Christ. The only way that this can be is if I come acknowledging my total depravity, understanding my degenerate nature, and come and confess to Jesus Christ that I have a perverted mind, that my mind is warped. I'm sorry, Lord, but that's what sin has done. And I come to you in the humility of Calvary, in the cross of Jesus Christ, and I bring my mind. It isn't all that it should be, and I need your help. I need my mind to be inspired by the Word of God. I need my mind to be regulated by the Holy Spirit. I need to come and exchange my perverted thinking for the thinking of Jesus Christ in heaven, for the mind of royalty, for the mind of the prince, for the mind of the king, and for the word of eternity. I need to have a new quality of life with an eternal dimension. Listen carefully. The mind of Jesus Christ is the first need. Some of you today think that your mind is perfect. The reason you think that is because you don't commit any atrocious acts of sin. But if there's bitterness and resentment and jealousy and hatefulness and, and derogatory thinking and indifference, then your mind is also perverted. The Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse 5 that the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. And all what you need in your counseling is a renewed mind from Jesus Christ. This man had a bad mind. I want you to see the second thing that happened, if you would please. In verse 17, they began to pray him to part out of their coast. That's Jesus. When he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed of the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. But saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee, and have compassion on thee. Notice Jesus said, don't follow me. Don't just take my coattail tail and follow me. Go home and tell your friends how good I've been to you. Tell somebody else about me. Don't just hang around me all the time. I'll go with you in principle. But what I want you to do is go tell your friends how I've had compassion on you. What motivated Jesus' deliverance of this man's possession? Compassion. Compassion on human sorrow, human sadness, and human suffering, and human sickness. This time it was sickness of the mind. Now notice verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. And what a thrill it is to see people that are honest today with all the boldness of the new birth, with all the courage of their new conviction, with all the Christ of their new life. Just tell how wonderful Jesus has been and what wonderful things he has done. That's what this guy did. He just said, I was demon-possessed and I was in a tomb and I didn't have any clothes and I was a madman. 
And I went to him and I said, why do you torment me? I had the wrong idea about Jesus. He didn't torment me at all. And then he cast out 60 demons in the name of Satan. He called it the devil, but there were 60 personalities taken over. Different personalities that gave my mind impulses to have different urges at different times. If you want some of the great things that God has given us in psychology, when you have a, an urge to hate somebody, that's a satanic impulse. And, oh, God, help you to know your enemy. When you have an urge to fear, that's a satanic impulse because Second Timothy 1.7 says that is not of God. When you have an urge to be bitter, when you have an urge to get even, when you have an urge to drink, when you have an urge to fight, when you have an urge to gossip, when you have an urge to doubt, then that impulse that's very real in your mind is from one of these demons who are very live today. They have will, emotion, and mind. They have a real personality in an invisible spiritual form. They are the cause of the effects upon those that yield not to Jesus Christ. And everything that happens to you either happens by the God of peace and the God of love or the Satan of confusion. It's either one of two major causes that produces that terrible detrimental and destructive effect. And I want you to see when Jesus was passed over again by the ship into the other side, much people gathered unto him and they began to gather. And I think that Jesus saw them in human sorrow, in human sadness, in human sickness, and in human suffering. And we find in verse 22, Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he besought him gratefully, saying, My little daughter, Lie, lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which, was, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, and rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around and about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what it was done in her, came and fell down before him and touched him with all the truth. And this morning, with the power of God this strong, you can be touched and healed and delivered right in your pew of an affliction this moment. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy place. I want you to see what happened. Jesus Christ renewed the mind of the terrible, tormented man in the tomb. Secondly, there was a sorrowing father. And the sorrowing father came with a sorrowing soul. His daughter was at the point of death, and she was 12 years of age. And she lived a little ways off. But Jesus had, a, had to renew her mind to teach a lesson. And then he had a sorrowing soul, that this soul was sorrowing even under the death of his daughter. And then he met a woman who had a body that because of a blood disease was weak and hindered and tormented with physical weakness. And Jesus had to do a work on a mind, on a soul, and on a body. And then he raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead to show us that it was all done through resurrection life. The three things that he did speak of spirit, soul, and body. And the fourth act of going into the house to raise the dead child speaks of four, which is earth number. He was doing something for sorrowing humanity upon earth with resurrection life raising people from the dead into that quality of life. He renewed the mind. He met the need of the sorrowing soul, and he healed the, the terrible need of the weak, afflicted body. Now listen carefully. When Jesus Christ enters into something, verse 2 says immediately, immediately he sees suffering, sorrowing, sick, troubled, sad humanity. Come with me just for a moment. Come with me for a moment as we knock on a door and we go into a house. 
Perhaps it's a stranger. We have not been there long before the individual tells us. We say, how many children did you have? And she said, I did have two. We do not know her. She says, now I have one. And we'll ask her what happened to the other child. And she said she drowned swimming at the age of four at a camp. And we said, would you like to meet her again in heaven? And she said she's dead. Don't tell me that. She's dead. Don't you know she drowned? We said, no, she isn't. She's living. She's living. She's living. And about 11 months ago today, the woman listened to our voice and said, and wept and said, do you mean it? A sorrowing heart because of a lost child, a burden that Christ, who has such a compassion on human suffering, healed. And when she accepted Christ, just a week later in that little church, she raised her hand and said, I can live again. My child is not in the grave. She is living. And she cried it out. She is living. Come with us again. In visitation. As we knock unto another heart. With this same Jesus. Renewing minds. Meeting the needs of sorrowing souls. And healing physical afflictions. We knock up another door. And before we know it. The woman tries to smile and act relaxed, but she says, my husband is in the hospital and he has cancer. They don't expect him to live. And tears come through her eyes, sorrowing humanity. Come with us again, as the father says, my son was wounded in Vietnam and Waterville. Come with us again, as we knock on doors and see burden after burden, and tear after tear, and heartache after heartache. And see if you can live in a convenient Christianity in modern America. This morning, at 4.15, as we prayed this morning, at 4.15, for all these problems, before God, that Jesus Christ would be Lord over them. And Lord over many of your lives who will not give up cigarettes and is killing you by inches and destroying you and sending you as a Christian that knows God into the feet slowly as a cancer eats your body. It isn't that cigarette will ever keep you out of heaven. It will not. But those cigarettes drive you a little bit closer to spiritual decay and cancer that someday will leap out and capture you. As we think of you in your social drinking, as we think of you in your negligence of church, these little things that seem so unimportant to you, and through stubbornness and rebellion, while the souls are perishing, while humanity is sorrowing, while the world is loaded with sickness and suffering, you go right on, complacent in your habits, rebellious, rebellious against God, and living in your own will in some areas, grieving the Holy Spirit, quenching the life of the risen Lord, being dominated in an area of your life by Satan. We could mention so many things. I cannot but think of the world today without identifying myself with Christ. I could not sleep last night after the fellows left. God would lay one party on my heart and then another. That Jesus might be Lord. That this lethargy, this slothfulness, this terrible slothfulness that has dominated the souls of some well-intended people that you'd be revolutionized. Thanking God for all of those that mean business to go with it. As a woman that came with Priscilla this week down to see me, John and Priscilla, who God is blessing greatly. And as they brought a woman down from Gardner with a broken home this week, and when she got out in the car on Tuesday night back with Priscilla, she said, I feel so good now, and I, I felt so bad when I come. And I said to God, as I was riding to Branch Pond, that's, that's what makes it worth it. As you communicate life, courage, health, inspiration, hope, faith, something that lasts forever. There isn't anything so beautiful, so poetic, 
so wonderful in all the world as a ministry of life to people that have need. And the world is full of sorrow and sickness and suffering and sadness and heartache and loneliness and trouble and grief and bereavement. And to be able to impact life, to be alive in Christ and to say something in the tender compassion of personal identification to the manifestation of reality, to the divinity of Christ and our humanity, using us as a medium of manifestation is the greatest privilege of the human man today and the human soul upon earth. You can take your part-time job. You can take your stay-at-home program. You can take your forgetting to tithe if you don't come to church and only tithe when you feel like it, when we've got a tremendous budget and 15 visions, winning souls in every one of them. You can take your callousness and thoughtfulness and your money that you spend foolishly and, and your and your thoughtfulness and take it, but I'll take this privilege of ministering and loving and giving and sharing and going and knowing and going and with Jesus Christ. As many of you have already taken this road too, let's take this road to meet our visions of the orphanage. Let's take this road in praying for our kids to be missionaries. Let's take this road as we as we go into our coffee house ministry. Let's take this positive, creative road as we go and build a ministry for God which will reach the world. I was thinking this morning of Isaiah. 49.16. Looking it up in the Hebrew, I found a most beautiful rendering of the word graven. And this is what it means. And Jesus says, I have tattooed you, my people, on both of the palms of my hands. And I thought, isn't that beautiful? Listen, what does a woman use to do the dishes, to sweep the floor, to make the bed, to, to pat the baby on the back, to put the child in the crib? As we wash our hands, what does a man use to do his work, to drive his car, his hands? And Jesus said, I didn't put you on my back. I didn't put you, I put you right on the palm of my hands, both of them. I've got your name tattooed, spiritually speaking, on the palms of my hands. And I thought, oh, Jesus, that's beautiful. That's precious. That's wonderful, glorious, marvelous, absolutely wonderful. You've got me on the palms of your hands. Thrilled by the Spirit, inspired by the Word, exalted because of the truth and reality of that wonderful manifested portion of the Word of God, we can say today that Jesus has you, God and Murphy, on the palms of his hands. Joan on the palms of his hands, he has you that believe in Jesus Christ on the palms of his hands. And when he looks down, there I am, there you are today, if you're saved, on the palms of Jesus' hands. One of the most unusual, heartbreaking things I think I saw was a pastor. He's playing a softball game with other pastors. And he wore a long sleeve white shirt, 92 degrees. And another pastor said, take off your shirt, don't be ridiculous. And you could see that the guy was getting uneasy. Finally, the guy with a long sleeve white shirt went up to him and said, please don't say that anymore. He said, when I was in the world, I had the picture of a naked woman tattooed on my arm. Since then, God has saved me, and I'm a pastor over the youth of a big church. He says, I'm never able to take off my white long sleeve shirts. I don't want the kids to see it, of course. And he wept and cried like a baby. He said, it's tattooed for life. Don't you see? So don't see it again. And Jesus has your names. If you're saved and washed in the blood, tattooed for life in the palms of his hands. Listen. i never forget what Mrs. Randall said before she died and I went to her bedside. She said at that time, she said, my folks haven't come. El Sanders was so faithful to her and many others, B and Fred and Barbara and many others were so faithful to her. And she said, I told the nurses you'd come. And that blessed me. She said, I told the nurses you'd come. And I thought of Jesus. And I thought, well, 
Jesus Christ always arrives on the scene. And if I'm walking in the Spirit, I'll arrive where I ought to arrive. But if, if we're a little faithful, how much more faithful he is. He always is there. Because he has you graven or, or tattooed. He said, I'll make your mountains, valleys, and I'll exalt you in, in the high places. And he said, I'll give you springs of water to guide you, the living water of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. They'll guide you, and your mountains will all be exalted before me. They will not be off. And I've got you on the palms of my hands. Listen, today as we close, the Lord Jesus renewed a mind that was tormented, met the need of a sorrowing soul, and healed an afflicted body. And he did it all. The number three, on earth number four, by the life that he raised the 12-year-old girl and 12, 12 speaks of judicial completeness. And brother, when we have resurrection life, we are complete in our spirit with a renewed mind, in our soul and in our body with resurrection power. In closing today, the Lord Jesus has got every Christian here tattooed on the palms of his hands. You see, you can't get very far from him. You can't do it. And he does it because he's got compassion. And he immediately sees your human suffering, your human sorrow, and your human sadness, and your human sickness. And he immediately goes to you. Jairus was, was a little disgusted because he healed the woman. But he did that to condition Jairus to have faith. Many times he'll do things to your soul and it will be delayed blessings so that your soul will be conditioned to believe by seeing something else that he does by sight which will turn your heart into faith. I hope that you catch a glimpse of his sorrow for the, for the suffering. And I hope today if you're here in any one of those conditions that you'll know that Jesus Christ's arms are outstretched to you with reality and life. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. He'll love you into being healed in every area of your need, spirit, soul, and body, with a life of resurrection. And Jesus Christ today for you Christians will take away those bad external habits and change them into redemption and change them into a redemptive life. And Jesus Christ will meet our needs today and help us meet our vision. Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm going to mention them to you again and again and again. Our 15 visions. And we're thrilled and all wrapped up in Jesus because they're his visions. Last night when Sandra came to say goodbye, she leaves this afternoon to go to Turkey. And I looked into her eyes last night, a young girl heading back for the field. And in my heart, I thought, God bless you. As the Spirit of God goes with you across the waters, as you leave perhaps your mother for the last time, I do not know, but possibly. Leaving maybe other loved ones for the last time, but as she gets on that ship and says goodbye with courage, with a goal, with vision, in a country where perhaps only 20 Christians are in an entire country. As she told me, with every temptation in the world, leaping at you at every minute in a godless heathen plan. And I thought, God bless her, she's got it. She's got it. I'm sure she'd like marriage. I'm sure that she'd like the things of this earth. But thank God she's counting on eternity. And she has an eternal call and a vision. And that's what we want our teenagers to have and our kids and our adults. Would you bow your heart? Close your eyes.